Okay, questions on homework. Let's say for chapter one. Yeah. What section is it? One point. One point five. One point five is the section. All right. Now number twenty nine. What what did that say? The integral of quantity x plus one over quantity x plus two. X plus one over x plus two. Yeah. And then it said to do like long division and format it into. A plus B okay. something yeah. over something. All right, yeah, that's one way to do it. Um, do you guys remember long division? No. <laughs> so we have to do this by long division. How did we do it? Take the guy here, put in the first guy here, right? Two into two goes one time. You're going to take that one, you're going to multiply it by this two, and put it below that, right? Subtract, right? So then it's gone. The seven comes down, and now you're thinking two into the seven, right? It goes how many times? Three times. You put the three here, then you multiply by this two, you get six. And then you subtract the six from the seven, right? And then you end up with one. Two into one you can't, so you know that the answer is three and 1 over 2, right? Because 1 is the remainder, right? So you're sort of doing the same thing except with polynomials. So here we have x plus 2 is the guy that we're dividing into x plus 1. And you're going to sort of do the same thing. You're going to take the first guy here, divide into the first guy here, x into x, one time. You're going to take that 1, you're going to multiply the guy here, and put it below. Right? So you're going to have this give you x plus 2, and you subtract that from above. The x's will die. 1 minus 2 gives you minus 1. So then it means the result is if you have x plus 1 divided by x plus 2, the answer is 1 plus the remainder over the divisor, saying that it's 1 over 1 minus x plus 2. So that's one way to do it. So if you have the antiderivative of x plus 1 over x plus 2, you do this long division and you realize it's exactly the same as saying the integral of this. And that one's more manageable, right? What's the integral of 1? What's the integral of this? That would be the answer. There are other options. You could have when the highest part is the same on the top and bottom, usually a trick like this might work. The trick is to try to get the denominator in the top by adding and subtracting convenient values. So if I had x plus 1, I want to get a x plus 2 in the top. So what I can do is I can say x add and subtract 2. Right? It's like adding 0, so it's not changing. So what you realize you have here is x plus 2 and minus 2 plus 1 gives you that minus 1. And you can literally just divide into each. Right? So you can split the fraction up. just one, right, and you ended up with the same thing exactly. Right? So you had a couple options. Right? But long division was recommended. It's, it works in general far more often. So yeah, so that was the idea. Rewrite this into something more manageable by using long division, and then from there it was not so bad. Other questions? x plus 1 to the 1 third power. 
Two thirds. Two thirds. Just three. Oh, just three. Okay. Huh? Yeah. Okay, how do I do that one? Hmm? U substitution. U substitution. What's U? 2x plus 1. equals 2x plus 1, your du would be 2dx, so this means 1 half du is equal to dx, and so you can substitute. So the dx is replaced by 1 half du, and then this guy is replaced by u, so this is just u. Right, so really what you have is 1 half times the antiderivative of 1 over u cubed du. How do we do that one? So it's u to the negative three. Right, write it in the form for the power rule. So this is just u to the minus three. And so you do the power rule. Add one to the power, divide by the new power. And so this is minus one over four, u to the minus two. And then back substitute. whatever makes the function simpler and its derivative can be found somewhere else. So that's the general rule. It's not necessarily always in the denominator. For example, if you're anti-differentiating ln x over x, your u would actually be the numerator. Because right? the derivative is 1 over x, which you can substitute. Right? Um, u equals x is never a good substitution, so picking the denominator here would not be the convenient. So it's not always the denominator, it's the convenient guy. Um, having two things in a denominator is complicated because if there's only one thing, you could just divide into each. So you want to make it less complicated, so you want to replace the denominator if it looks complicated. And you have to make sure that the derivative, the, the variable part of it, is somewhere else, that you can swap it out. But here, this denominator is pretty simple, so it's probably not the best one. So it's not just do the denominator. That's not the rule. It's something else that we look for. Uh, was there another? Yeah? Well, 25. Uh, integral of e to the x plus e to the negative x squared. The whole thing. That, that's it? Yeah. All right, how do you do this one? Well, multiply out, right? So this is e to the 2x plus 2 plus e to the minus 2x.
Yes, the middle the middle term would be two e to the x times e to the minus x, right? Which is just two e to the x minus x, because you add the powers and you multiply. So that's just two e to the zero, and e to the zero is one, so you get two. And what's the antiderivative of this? Yeah, so that one was falling. Substitution wouldn't work. dx for every constant c, the expression y equals x e to the x plus c e to the x is a solution to dy dx equals e to the x plus So they want you to verify that this is a solution. It means that if this is your y, then this equation will be true. So to verify that, all we have to do is assume this is actually your y and prove that this is true. And how we can do it is by, um, the better way to do it is by working on each side separately, right? So this side of the equation, you can call it the left-hand side. And this side of the equation, you can call it the right-hand side. And you're going to end up showing that if you make this assumption, these two will both be the same. So here we can say what would the left hand side be with this assumption? dy dx would actually be what? Differentiate this, what do I get? x e to the x plus e, x. plus e to the x, right? Because I did the product rule. Derivative of this plus c to the x. 
right? So that is what the left hand side would give you. What if I look at the right hand side? If I look at the expression e to the x plus y, what would that give me? Well, I'd have this e to the x here plus, I'm assuming that y is this, so I just plug it in. But this is addition, I can rearrange the terms if I'd like. So I could put this x e to the x in front plus e to the x plus c e to the x, which ends up being exactly the same as I got for the left hand side. Right? So it's verified. They actually give me the same thing. Yes. Yes, you have to show that if you make this assumption, this equation is true, which means each side gives you the same thing independently. Okay, so first you move the right hand side, right? Yeah, start with the left hand side and you compute what it says. The left hand side was just the derivative, so I just took the derivative and figured out what it was. The right hand side said I have to take e to the x and add it to the y. So if I assume my y was this, I just take that, put it here, and simplify it. And I should get the same thing that I got when I computed the derivative, which in this case I did. They're the same. Okay. Assume this are the same. Another way that you could do is actually to just solve this differential equation and show that that's your solution. But this one is sort of rough, because you'll notice that it's not separable. You actually can't separate x's and y's. And the technique that you need for something like this, I actually didn't teach you about. And I don't think it's in our syllabus at all, actually. So um, this is the better way to do a problem like this. Because you can always do this way with the current techniques that you know. Other questions in 2.5? Oh, well, it's the same sort of thing, right? So um, we have c greater than or equal to 0. Show y equals minus x plus radical root squared plus c is a solution. I would do the same thing, right? So we assume that y is actually this. Then the left hand side would give me dy dx would be equal to, how do I differentiate that? It's minus 1 plus, what's the derivative of this? Right, by doing the chain rule, writing this radical as a half power and doing the chain rule, I would get this. I can simplify a little bit. 2 goes into this 2 times. And so what I get is 1 um, plus 2x, 2x squared plus c to the minus 1. And what I want to do is show that the right-hand side would actually give me that same thing. Well, the right-hand side is a single fraction. Maybe I should write this as a single fraction. But we'll see. What about the right-hand side? If I take x minus y over x plus y, what would that give me? x minus y means I just plug in this y. And 
x plus y. So now our task is to see if when this is simplified, does it give us this? Because right? that would mean it is actually a solution. So here we have x minus a minus x, so that gives me what? 2x minus this guy. What would the denominator be? Just this guy, right? The x's would cancel each other, and I'd be left with 2x squared plus c. And what I can do now is I can split these guys up. gives us 1, so that's a minus 1 here. And this, of course, I can write as 2x times 2x squared plus c to the minus 1 half, which is the same as the left-hand side. So let's verify. So I want to find the particular solution here, which means I need to solve for that c. Whenever they give you a condition like this, it means they want you to find the value of c that will give you such a result. So basically, this one is what? It's the x value, right? And this is the corresponding y value. It means that if my y is that, I can plug in x equals 1, and the result should be 1 as well. So this gives me 1 is equal to minus 1 times 1 squared plus c, which means this I can bring over, that's 2, this is just 2 plus c, I want to get to c, so what I can do is I can square both sides, 4 plus 2 plus c, this means that c is equal to 2, and this means that y equals minus x plus And that's the particular solution that satisfies this condition. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Same section? Yeah. Number 11. Use separation of variables to solve. Whenever they give you this guy, it means that they don't want any arbitrary constant c in your answer. You have to find all the numerical values. Okay, so how do we do separation of variables here? Cross multiply, right? Right, get the y's on this side and all the t's on that side. We separate the variables and we can integrate. And so the integral of this. I can multiply through by 2. 2c two technically, but it's still an arbitrary case. And how do I solve for y? I can ln both sides. So this means that 2y will be equal to ln of t squared plus c. And so this means your y would be 1 half ln t squared plus c. But they gave us this condition, which means they don't want this plus c. I need to find what that value is. Which means 
here, when I plug in the t value 0, the y value should be 1. So here I'm going to plug in t equals 0 and plug in 1 for the y. This means 1 is equal to 1 half ln of 0 plus c. So this 1 is equal to 1 half ln c. To multiply both sides by 2. And so what is c? E squared. As raised both sides of e to kill this ln, you get c is equal to e squared. This means that your y is 1 half ln of t squared plus e squared. Everyone understand? Any questions so far? leave the two on this side, although it doesn't really matter, but I think it'll be nicer to leave it on that side. I divide by the y squared, bring that over, and then multiply by the dx. So here I have 1 over y squared dy is equal to 2x dx. And then I can... And this would give you ln of y squared, right? No. Who said yes? <laughs> no. Right? How do you do that one? Y to the minus minus. Right, you have to rewrite it as y to the minus 2 and apply the power rule. So here we have y to the minus 1 negative. Here we have x squared plus c, which means I can multiply through by minus 1. Still an arbitrary constant plus c minus c is an arbitrary constant. Uh, two rows over. No, because the two was here. So, and so now this is y to the minus one, so I can just flip both sides. So y would be one over minus x squared plus c. But now I have this condition, so I have to fulfill that. This guy means when x is 0, my y is 2. So in here, if I plug in x equals 0, y will be 2. I would have 2 is equal to 1 over 0 plus c. This means that c is equal to 1 half. This means that your y is equal to minus x squared plus 1 half. This is a complex fraction, which they don't like typically, so you can solve this by multiplying by 2 over t. Why isn't it negative? And so you have... It should have been negative 1 half. And the negative 1 half, why? Oh, over side. No, I just flip both sides. Yeah. No, but it's 1 over negative. Ne the the right-hand side is negative on that. Is that the answer you got? No. It would depend how you write it out. If here I multiply uh, through by minus one, if you change this to a minus c, then technically here you get minus a half, but then when you plug it in, the minus would cancel and you still get plus in here. Right, so yeah, when you're multiplying the c by a constant, it really doesn't matter. Because at the end of the day, when you solve for it using this, you will get to the answer. How'd you get the negative y? 
negative one. Power rule. Add one to the power, you get negative one, divide by the new power. Divided by negative one is the same as multiplying by negative one. the same thing. Right? It's just algebra. If you, from the bottom, if you factor out a minus sign, you get that, which is what they have. So you can just put the minus in front. I guess they didn't like the minus in the front. Right? It's the same thing. So, other questions? Yeah. There's an empty desk over here. I guess that's it. Up, just pass them to the person in front of you until they get to the front. I asked if there were questions, the ones saying. I actually have a question. What's the question? Number 22. Suppose you deposit an initial principal of $1,000 in a company, 6% annual interest compound continuously. Every year included the first, you make an additional deposit of 500 spread out uniformly throughout the year by the year instead of the Okay, so part A is just a technicality. They pretty much want you to regurgitate this argument that they had in the book and plug in the numbers. Um, Basically, they wanted you to reason that the change in your principle is determined by two things. It is determined by you're starting with the principle, and then you're multiplying by the interest rate per unit time. Right? Plus, you're depositing some amount of money per unit time. And so you have to multiply both of those by delta t. So here, you have delta P is equal to delta T times, your R was 0 0.06, your K was 500. And you can divide through by delta T, assuming it's non-zero. And then you're like, oh, this sort of reminds me of something. Change in y over change in x. It sort of looks like the form for the derivative. And so what you do is you take a limit to make things simpler. Limit is delta t goes to 0 of both sides.
This side is just the derivative of p with respect to t by definition. And this side, since there's no delta t's anywhere, it's just itself. And so that's how they derived the formula that they gave you here. And in part b, we want to solve it, satisfying the initial condition p of 0 is 1,000. The only place you'll be asked to do this is in homework, typically. I, I've never really seen them actually in a final to do that, and I won't ask you in a test to do it. But you would be expected to get to this, this formula, right? So I would just say, I would, unlike a test, you'd just be given this paragraph, and I won't tell you the formula. I expect you to be able to write this down. Right? You don't have to derive it like this, but you should be able to say it. This is the guy I'm going to work with. And so, part B, you want to solve it. How do we do it? two decimal places. And so now what we can do, it's actually separable. So I can divide the both sides by this guy and multiply by dt, and I would obtain in which case I would integrate both sides. This side would be ln This equation will give you the current balance at time t in this account. Uh, after 10 years, what will the total principal in the account be in A? How much is deposit? How much is from interest? Okay, I have a question. Is it possible to get a negative answer for time? No. I got a negative answer and I have to see the equation. Um, well, let us see. Very usually, what if you get if you solve it correctly, everything's correct, and you get a negative answer for time, it would simply mean that the situation is impossible. Right? Like what you're trying to find is actually, will actually never happen. Um, but I don't believe that is the case here. So it says after ten years, you want to know how much is there. So. Balance would be 
just be p of 10, plug in 10 for t. So this is 9333.33d to the point 0 0.06 times 10 minus 8333.33. It's what? 8,673. 8,673.11. So that's how much money you'll have in roughly 10 years. So if you start with $1,000, keep depositing 500, in this particular bank account, after 10 years, that's how much money you'll have. How much is interest? You just, subtract. Okay. you just understand that the balance is equal to the interest plus the deposits. And we know how many how much we deposited. Right? Is that original thousand count? Is it like this deposit when they're looking for that kind of answer? No. I, the original, like you mean the one thousand yeah, dollars? That count as a deposit when I ask that kind of How much of this total comes from deposits? It's that not clear here, but let's assume it, it is counted. So we know the balance is 8673. The interest, I don't know, but I definitely know the deposits. It's 500 times 10. Plus a thousand, if we want to include the original starting point. Don't know if you would count that, but okay. So we'd have 8673.11. If we're counting the original, what we opened the account with, then we would have in total $6,000 here. Which means the interest is. Two six seven three three thousand dollars and then the deposits would be six thousand total, right? Including the one thousand you used to open the account. I'll be more specific if I ask you a question which one I'm talking about. Well, it depends how you solve it. Um, there was a point where, it didn't really show, but there was a point where I swapped out E to the C for C. So clearly if you saw for one, you might get a different number. You'd have to check what you did. It might be correct, actually. I'd have to look at it. But it's possible. It depends how you do the arithmetic. solve some sort of ODEs, like the ones we've been doing that are separable and that sort of stuff. 
But it turns out that a lot of the times we actually can't solve the differential equation or we just don't have the tools to solve it. And so what we often settle for are numerical approximations. So I can't get the actual answer, but I can at least approximate it at some point. Right? And so that's sort of the idea behind um, numerical solutions. How to get an answer that's useful when you can't really get the answer because you can't do separation of variables and it's complicated. Right? So um, that's what chapter three is about. We're going to go through a couple techniques on how to actually get that done. There are various reasons why you might want to do this. Uh, and so here's the idea that we're going to use. So pretend this guy here is our function y. So there is some differential equation over here where this guy is the solution, but I can't really find the formula for this graph specifically. But I don't really care about the formula. I just want to know, after this much time, what is the y value, right? I just care about the approximation at a certain point. So what we can do is we can take a point we can call x, and we can actually draw a tangent line to the curve. And so what we can do here is if I want to approximate it a little out of the way, like if I move a distance delta x, and I ask what is the y value here, because I don't know the function itself, however, finding the equation of a tangent line is easy, I can do that. I can approximate this by that value. So the actual change in the y value that is called delta y, right? That's the change in the y value. But the change between the tangent line and the curve, that is what we call dy. That's where the calculus comes in. It's really an approximation to the change in y. And so what we can do is say, this is the actual y value, but if I get close enough, the tangent line will almost be that value. Right? You'll notice that if the x was here, the difference in the y values which would be much smaller. So basically the idea is, I'll be able to find the tangent line because you're giving me the differential equation. I know the slope, right? So I'll be able to find the tangent line, no problem. So even if I don't know the actual function, all I have to do is just get the tangent line close enough to the point, and the difference between them won't be that much, right? And I can actually gauge the difference. So that is the idea. So I'm not going to solve the differential equation. I'm going to use what I know about the slope to actually approximate the y value. And we are going to cover two main methods for doing this. But the methods are going to require that we know a couple formulas that we're going to derive. So let's start with here. Notice that. Approximate the rise by dy. Approximation of the rise. 
the run is, of course, delta x. This gives us the idea that dy is f prime of x times delta x. So we can approximate the new y value. The new y value is just going to be the old y value plus this change that I made, right? So I'm going to take the old value that I had here, add this change, and that's going to give me the new y value. That's sort of how we're going to do it. And so this would mean that the new y, which we're going to call y new, is equal to y old plus this value f prime of x times delta x, by just swapping that out. Thus, we get what they call, the book calls it Euler's formula, did they? No, they didn't. They just called it theorem 3.1. And it says, if delta x is small and we know f of x and prime of x, then equation in this theorem is the important part. And yes, it's one you have to memorize. So this is just the new y value at this xi that you move over. We can get it by taking the old y value plus the change in y, which we've derived as this value. And so we end up with this formula, which your book says is theorem 3.1. Now, let's use it to approximate some stuff so you can actually see it in action. See how this formula works now. And then we're going to use it to help us find differential equations, solutions. So the first challenge is to figure out what is your f, right? What function are you going to use to your advantage? And the function you can often get from the way the number looks itself, right? Here, I have a radical of some number. So radical x seems like a good function to think about. Take f of x equals radical x, right? Then we want to approximate f of 25.1, right? So if I choose this to be my function, what I'm really looking for is this guy, right? The y value at this x value. So now, so here's the thing. I want the change in x to be small, and I want to make sure that I know what f of x and f prime of x is. So what I'm going to want to do is break this number into two numbers, right? One is where I know what the value is at that point, and then the other one is just a small difference. So what do you think the numbers will be? 25, right? If I choose x equals 25, and delta x would therefore be 
delta x would be 0.1. I know what this is at 25. Radical of 25 is just 5, right? And of course, if I take the derivative and plug in 25, I'd be able to find that answer too, right? And then 0.1 is just, compared to 25, is just a small change. It means that this formula can apply with some degree of accuracy. So I'm going to use those in this formula. So how do I do it? First, I need to find f prime, because I'm going to use this one. So f of x equals radical x, which means f of 25 is just radical 25, which is 5. So far, so good. f prime of x would be, what's the derivative of radical x? 1 over x to the negative 1x. Right. 1 over 2 radical x, which means if I take f prime at 25, I would get 1 over 2 times radical 25, which is just 1 tenth. This means the radical of 25.5 is really just f of 25.1. That is f of 25 plus 0.1. I'm just writing out so you can see that this is the left side of the formula, right? This is my x plus delta x. Now, according to that formula, this will be approximately equal to f of 25 plus f prime of 25 times delta x. Times 0.1. Right, because this guy is your f of x, f prime of x, and this is delta x. f of 25, I know, that's 5. The derivative evaluated at 25 is 1 tenth. And delta x is also 1 tenth. So this ends up being 5 plus 1 over 100, which is... 501 over 100. Right? So basically, what that is is 5.01. That's the approximation. If you actually plug this into your calculator to find out the actual answer, it would be do this. Um, 5.00999002 continue. So if you plug that into your calculator, this is the answer you'll get. But notice if you round it to two decimal places, right? Our approximation was accurate up to the second decimal place. Yes? This is the same thing as linear. Yeah. Same thing as linearization. If you did 201, it's linearization. <laughs> right. Um, they don't call that that here. But for those of you who did 201, yes, exactly the same as linearization. Just expressed in a different language. And it's derived using the differentials. Okay. So, and that's it. So it's like a linear approximation, exactly. So. Without a calculator, you can do this by hand, and you can get something that's very close to the actual value. And the smaller your delta x is, the closer you will be to the actual value. Okay. Um, so it's not that bad if you get some practice, but let's do some a couple more examples. So it really gets home. How about... Yes, I made the delta x even smaller. Approximately 25.05. By the way, the actual answer I had computed earlier, plugged in my calculator, it's very similar to this one. It should be 5.0049975. That's the actual answer. Let's see if our approximation, how good it is. Did you 
guys memorize the formula yet? Approximately equal to f of x plus f prime of x times both of x. So here, x equals blah, delta x equals blah, f of x equals blah, prime of x. So here, what's your x? 25. This is just a small change, so it's 0 0.05. What would you take as f of x? Radical 25. It's radical x, right? which means that f of 25 is just radical 25. It's again 5. f prime? Same thing. So it's 5 plus 1 over 200. And what's that? Five point zero zero five roughly, right? Yeah. What was the actual answer? Five point zero zero four nine. We have rounded it off. We get five point zero zero five. So this guy was accurate up to two decimal places, right? I approximated pretty much the same thing, the radical function. Here the difference was point one, and I was accurate up to one decimal place. Here I made the difference even smaller, I get accurate up to two decimal places. So it's just sort of showing you the smaller you get, the better the approximation. Because it means that the curve and the tangent line are closer together. Okay, let's do another one. Actual answer is 
what would you take your x to be? Eight. It's a number very close to 7.9 that I actually know what the cube root is. What would your delta x be? Minus 0.1. Because 8 plus or minus 0.1 gives me the 7.9. f of x? Just think to be the cube root of x, which is x to the 1 third, which means f of 8 is just 2. The derivative would be? 1 third um, x to the negative 2 third. All right, which is? I can rewrite this. One third. I can have the cube root of x squared. Which means if I take the derivative evaluated at 8, I'd have 1 over 3 times the cube root of 8 squared. Cube root of 8 is 2. I squared, I get 4. 3 times 4 is 12. So I get 1 over 12. Here, the cube root of 7.9, well, that's just f of 8 minus 1. That's my x. This is my delta x. This is approximately equal to f of 8, plus f prime of 8, times that minus 0 0.1. This guy knows 2. This guy is 1 over 12. This guy is minus 1 over 10. So this is 2 plus 2 minus 1 over 120. Right, so that's 240. That's 239 over 120. Which, by the way, what's that roughly? One point nine nine one six six seven. Mm -hmm. Look at that. One, two, three, four decimal places. So that's how you can approximate different y values. We're actually going to use this to solve approximate differential equations at certain points, but I won't have time to do that and give you the gift that I prepared for you guys today. Yes, it's a quiz. I know. Jerome is the best. I know. All right. Turn that off and put your stuff away from me.